The following Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by Alan Franklin and is entitled, Christians Better Wake Up. For a free catalog of over 200 awesome Stealing the Mind Bible studies on DVD, CD, or audio tape, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 or on the web at compass.org. Sorry about the uh, slight technical hitch. Everywhere I go, um, technical trouble seems to follow me, which is quite interesting. We've just had to uh, borrow uh, Mike's computer, and uh, we've had the. Uh, this afternoon, we downloaded the program onto a, uh, a new disc, so fortunately, we had a backup. But uh, at the last minute, the computer packed up. It worked all right up until now. Interesting, isn't it? So it must be uh, something on this program, certainly not me, but something on the program that's worth. Uh, looking at and listening to. Now, what's this Englishman doing uh, looking at the Liberty Bell? Well, the bell was actually made in England. Um, it was rung out, as you know, um, in 1776, um, just after you had a small problem with the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> just think you could have had uh, Prince Charles as king. You know, what a thrilling thought. <laughs> we'll transfer him to you. Um, there are those who think that uh, under the uh, coming North American Union, the Queen, who's Queen of Canada, will then become Queen of America. So we get the lands, lost lands back, you see. It's all a plot. It's all a plot. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm wearing this because I believe in the nation state, and I'm really just making a statement that uh, ever since that time, 1776, you have been a free and independent sovereign nation. That freedom, that sovereignty is under threat on the bell it said, proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. I wish I had a bell today because I'd ring the bell. Because your liberty is under threat. And I'm trying to, going to try and wake everybody up, inform you as to what's going on, and say that if you think it's impossible, if you think that what I'm describing is in any way fanciful or some kind of conspiracy theory, I can assure you that uh, we have all the facts. Everything they've done to us in the European Union, the EU, they're about to try and do to you. In fact, there's some way down the line. Uh, time is short. In a way, it's a good time to be a, a born-again believer because as time is short, we know that the Lord Jesus is coming back soon. These are the times of the signs, and we're looking at uh, signs everywhere, when prophecy is coming true in the newspapers, in the headlines every day. And I know about that because I was a newspaper editor for 21 years, wrote a lot of headlines, but unfortunately very few of them were Christian. Now that we've got away from the secular media, Pat and I run something called the Free Press Online.co.uk, which you can look up and anything interesting about end times, prophecy, uh, politics, whatever takes our fancy, we put on there and uh, it's not censored so you can get the facts as far as we're able to ascertain them. We do a lot of time, we spend a lot of time in research getting material for this. We have some good writers. Uh, Chuck Baldwin is one that you probably are familiar with. So, we are coming into the times that uh, Daniel spoke of. The prophet Daniel, when he interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, really could have had very little knowledge of what, what was to come. But he saw the four empires, which ended in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was to be revived at the very end of time, the end of man's misrule of earth. And, of course, the Roman Empire has been revived, and is being revived as we speak I've been talking about it for some years, but recently they've actually been confirming it from their own mouths. This is what the president of the European Commission, Jose Barroso, said in July, not very long ago. Sometimes I like to compare the European Union to the organization of an empire. We have a dimension of empire, megalomania, I think. The European Union has at the moment 27 countries and about 500 million citizens. It has 2 million men under arms. It has a very healthy balance of trade surplus, unlike America. It's a very formidable force being welded together into one super state. I've been talking about the revived Roman Empire, so I was delighted when they had an exhibition in a circus tent in Brussels, Belgium, where the European Union has one of its main headquarters. Now, many of us have thought for years that they were clowns, and they proved it by putting up this tent. <laughs> but the key thing was, they said, 
We are the revived Roman Empire. And I thought, from their own lips, they said it, you see. Very significant. And they said in 2004, just after 10 new countries had come into the European Union, uh, that was all the um, eight countries of the Soviet USSR empire that had fallen apart, and two island nations, Malta and Cyprus, just after then, the EU had expanded to 25 nations. They said, we're going to expand again. They said, we're going to include all the countries around the Mediterranean, from Morocco to Syria. The key one for me was Israel. They're meddling in Israel far more than I realized until I did a lot of research, which, in fact, their Israeli son-in-law brought the Jerusalem Post over to me. And we now have the Jerusalem Post ticker on our website. But I read that um, the European Union was heavily involved, that the Israelis have a sort of a neighborhood status with the EU, and the EU is going over there telling them how to run their country and what policies to adopt. And the big stick they've got, the carrot and the stick, if you like, if you um, do as we say, you can trade with us. If you don't do as we say, I'm afraid you won't be able to trade with 500 million people right next door to you. So the Israelis have a mission to the European Union, and this is their flag and logo on the Israeli mission to the European Union. The EU has its hooks very firmly into Israel. Now, at the moment, there are European troops along the border with Lebanon, and they're there to actually prevent hostilities breaking out again. And these troops are from the Western European Union, which is the military arm of the EU. And this was established under Recommendation 666, of the EU, which may or may not be significant. I, thought, I always find things like this interesting and unlikely to be coincidence. So I think that uh, we be mo may be moving quite close to the seven-year peace treaty with Israel, which Antichrist will make, of course. That's how he will be finally and firmly identified. Good news is, of course, we won't be here then. We will be raptured first. What they're doing in Europe and what they're shortly trying to do in America is merging the countries into one state. They're saying that uh, we have to shut our embassies. Britain must give, give up its seat on the Security Council, where it's the main supporter of America, and be replaced by an EU representative. And we'll have single embassies. All this is an incredible development for something which started out, just as the North American Union did, as a trade agreement. And we already have a European sort of prototype FBI called Europol. These people have powers of arrest in Britain. This is how a major newspaper in London saw the development. A European police state is being developed before our eyes. Now, the last person who tried to unite Europe under one government was Adolf Hitler. He wanted what they now have. 13 countries out of the 27 have a common currency, the euro. They have one government one law. Hitler called his plan the New World Order. As a, a reporter, I was in the Parliament building in Brussels when the delegates all voted on the euro. I was there uh, for several days as a guest. We published, among other things, a business newspaper. MEPs wrote columns for us, so I got invited. It's very interesting. I listened in on the debate. There was hardly any debate. Now, if you thought America was going to give up the dollar... There might be just a little bit of opposition. But here I saw Germany give up the Deutschmark. France gave up the franc. Italy gave up the lira. Hardly any debate. It was like a, they were all hypnotized or something. Anyway, then they voted, yes, we'll all abolish our currencies, abolish our treasuries. We'll all have a common currency. Now, if you have a common currency, it's like uh, me giving my wallet to you and saying, well, you can spend most of it how you like, but give me back just a little bit of pocket money. That's how much freedom the countries of Europe now have. All the power is in Brussels and Strasbourg, the twin capitals of the European Union. Anyway, I um, took advantage of the EU's very splendid hospitality. They're very good to journalists. They give you a good lunch, all on the taxpayer. So uh, I thought, well, I'll enjoy a good lunch while I'm here. And uh, we went up to the dining room, very splendid. It's a bit like this place in some ways, actually. <laughs> Probably about as expensive. And, and uh, that, was, that, was, that was naughty. Sorry, sorry, Pat. 
Um, I said I'd be good. Anyway, um, we had lunch together, and uh, I, I was talking with those two journalists, me and another journalist, and uh, six MEPs, members of the European Parliament, you see. And I said, well, congratulations, you've got one currency. And I said, you've got one government here. And I said, um, you know, really, you're one state, one country. And they couldn't disagree because that's the whole point of the EU, ever closer union, you see. And uh, I said, what's the next step? These are clever men, barristers and so on, and, uh, and they looked at me in puzzlement, as if, what's he talking about? I said, well, clearly, you're going to have to have one leader. And then I said, um, I, was, <laughs> I said, one Fuhrer, and then I said, one Antichrist, and they looked at me as if I was insane. None of this had ever occurred to them, you see. That is the way it is going in Europe. Hitler was the very first Europhile. Everything the Nazis dreamt up has now been put into place all across Europe. When I go back on Thursday to Britain, I don't go back as a citizen of Great Britain. I go back as a citizen of the European Union. My passport, which I can show you, on the top of it, it says European Union. That's what I'm a citizen of, first and foremost. There is no such thing as British passport control with a Union Jack on it. There is no such thing and hasn't been for many years. And this is uh, where they're coming from. The EU poster showing the Tower of Babel being rebuilt by what looked what look like robotic slave laborers. The stars are pentagrams, which is quite significant in witchcraft. And they said that we are rebuilding Babel. And here they did it. This is the European Parliament building in Strasbourg. Strasbourg's in France on the border of Germany. And it's deliberately left unfinished, as you can see, because it's modeled on the Tower of Babel right here deliberately left unfinished, which I thought was very significant, interesting, a strange thing to do. And this man I know very well, his name is Mar Nigel Farage, and he's a leader of a United Kingdom Independence Party from which I got the tie and the flag. Now, Nigel, as far as I know, is not a Christian. However, he saw what was going on, and he walked into this building and he said, it's not like walking into a parliament building, it's like walking into the temple of a strange new religion. So I thought, yes, you sense something there, something very strange going on. How are they going to start to enforce all this against the will of the people? The people of Europe don't want to be a super state. France and the Netherlands voted against it. The constitution by which they were going to set up a state should have been null and void. However, they're bringing it in, and they plan to actually watch us and enforce their laws and enforce things in a very totalitarian way. Big Brother has arrived in Europe, and I'll show you very much what I mean. We have five million of these cameras in Britain. Uh, that's one for every 12 men, women, and children in the country. Pat and I have our own, um, right opposite our house. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. We have these um, camera setups in every town and every village in Great Britain. They monitor all movement. They're watched 24 hours a day. Every road you drive down, apart from a few tiny lanes, your car is watched and tracked. The number plates are, are watched and recorded. In fact, they've got a system now. They're updating all the, upgrading all the cameras. They're going to monitor every journey by every car, by every motorist, everywhere, every day, and retain all that information for two years, and the proviso is that it will be extended for five years. So if they wanted to find out what you were doing two years ago, they could actually call up your number plate and track and trace you. Amazing, isn't it? We actually went and filmed in this uh, control room, so I know all this is absolutely accurate. We saw them watching every road in Britain. And uh, if you think that uh, you're losing freedom here, you certainly are. But over, over here in Britain, we've got uh, something called um, an ID card coming in with a microchip on it, rather as they're trying to bring in over here. And uh, this man tried to protest at Tony Blair's Labour Party conference. All he did was walk along carrying a big card, protesting about it, and he's got the Stars of Europe on the card there. And the police, very heavy-handedly, as you can see, filmed him up close, intimidated him. Then they arrested him for causing a breach of the peace. He was fined. He now has a criminal record, which means he wouldn't be admitted to the United States. A peaceful protest in Great Britain today. This is what the police do to you. Their next plan is to put microphones into all these cameras so they can listen in to conversations on the streets. And if that's not Big Brother, I don't know what it is. 
And they also plan to have uh, microchips in every car to track and charge all drivers for every journey you make. It's a new tax scheme. You see, under the new green regime that's coming in all around the world, part of the new world order to track and control everybody and pretend that the car is the villain. You see, if you're in a car going where you please, meeting whom you please, at a time of your choosing, you're a free man or woman. If your car is tracked or if you have to go on public transport, they know where you're going all the time. This is not, not paranoia. This is Britain today. And this is right opposite our house, in case you think that this is far-fetched. This was taken from inside our house, and here's the three cameras that focus in 24 hours a day on our house. Not just on us, but other things as well. I don't, I'm not important enough for them to actually have a camera especially for me, but I'm just showing that all our houses are watched. Not all their houses, a lot of houses. They now are putting uh, bugs, electronic bugs, in their dustbins or wheelie bins, as we call them, trash cans, to spy on what we dump. So that if we put the wrong can or the wrong thing in the wrong recycling bin, there's a heavy fine. So here I am looking for my... <laughs> I, di I didn't find it. Some people have actually found them and taken them out and smashed them to bits. They're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> So is their freedom lost? Is your freedom lost? Not if people wake up. Not yet it isn't. Because what happened to us could happen to you. We've had a super state created above our heads with very few people realizing what was going on. And now the North American Union is being formed. Hang on a minute. There we go. And it's part of the New World Order. It's not a conspiracy theory. A lot of people will say to you, this isn't real. This is an exaggeration. Well, you are, at the moment, the number one nation in the world. I love America. I love to come here and see old glory flying on the flags. My wife is from St. Louis. I've always found it thrilling, the patriotism of the people of this country. However, you are giving away your sovereignty. The plans are far advanced. No treaty has been signed. They'll always say this. Well, no treaty has been signed. However, it is happening. It happened this last week in Canada. don't know how many of you know this, but um, there was something called a Security and Prosperity Partnership Conference in Canada between President Bush and the heads of Mexico and Canada. A few protesters got to hear about it, and they were up there protesting. The Canadian Prime Minister said they were pathetic, and President Bush said they were comical. So if you think... Uh, giving away your country is comical, you would agree with the president. I think that people are very right to be concerned. Why is it not in the major media? You might well ask. I can tell you later, uh, because I was an editor for a long time with a large media group. You are free to report the news up to a point until you start to run against the, uh, how shall I say, um, the status quo that they want you to report. You can only go up to a certain point and not beyond it. Lou Dobbs, very bravely and boldly on CNN, has exposed the plans for the North American Union. This is what he said on 60 Minutes. They're creating a brave new world in which the will of the people is irrelevant. Now, I wonder how long he's going to keep his job. I'm watching for him to be hounded out. The, the AMRO is what they're going to replace the dollar with. Now, this actually was, uh, went out on a, a major news channel, uh, surprisingly enough. And this is what a top money man in the London stock market said. His name was Steve Previs. And he said, the AMRO, that's the one thing nobody is talking about. It's the proposed new currency for the North American community being developed between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, what they were talking about on Monday and Tuesday. The idea is to make a borderless community just like the EU with the dollar, the Canadian dollar, and the peso replaced by the AMRO. And you can watch this uh, clip on YouTube. You can actually replay it and see that it's, again, reality. He says, the Canadians are pretty upset about it, but the Americans, except for the Texans, have their heads in the sand. <laughs> There's a few Texans here, obviously. <laughs> what is the North American Union? Well, they plan immediately the merger of the three countries. South and Central America will possibly be included later. CAFTA brings in the uh, Central America. Here are some of the agreements or partnerships. They call them anything they, they, they like, as long as it sounds innocent, you see. It's a partnership. It sounds harmless. Who would be against a partnership? You know, it depends who you're a partner with, doesn't it, really? 
between the three countries. 1994, this was the first one, NAFTA, free trade. All these things always start out with merging economics, free trade, you see. The, pol the politics follow on later. 2001, fr free trade area of the Americas, involving 34 nations. I think Cuba will probably be the odd one out. That hasn't got very far yet. 2005, CAFTA was signed, bringing in Central America. 2005, the Security and Prosperity Partnership. This is the one that's really developed fast. Um, there are about 20 working groups uh, in the State Department working on the moment on harmonizing different uh, agreements between the three countries on all kinds of trading issues. And the Summit of the Americas is something else which is ongoing. And again, it's talking about harmonizing the hemisphere. When's all this going to happen? Well, we've seen a lot of documents, and uh, Pat does a lot of research with me, and the year 2010 crops up quite frequently. So they seem to think that uh, this is the target date. Now, they've missed targets before, so that may not be absolutely right, but they're, abs they're trying to do it fairly quickly. Uh, there are many documents which mention the date 2010. Here, uh, the guilty men, <laughs> 2001 in Quebec, Canada, President Bush is here, and this is when the uh, NAFTA free trade agreement was signed. And uh, the chairman of the meeting, very significantly, if you follow these things, was one David Rockefeller, who seems to be behind most of the moves to actually bring in a world government. Facts from the State Department, because when I get my facts, I like good sources. As a journalist, the only thing that matters is good sources. We get plenty of rumors. Most rumors are false. You have to go to recognized sources like press offices of the White House, State Department, the EU press offices, thousands of pages we wade through, and you can find all kinds of, of significant information out. It's all there, if you like, hidden in plain view. Not many people have the time or the patience or the knowledge, really, to go through hundreds of these pages until you, you get to the nitty-gritty. But I found all these buzzwords on this document, which I believe I have here, actually. Globalism, hemispheric integration, collective responsibility, an inter-American court. Under NAFTA, by the way, they already have set up a legal entity, a tribunal by which uh, cases are tried involving American, Canadian, and Mexican companies. It's a supranational entity, so it's already trying cases uh, above the courts of your country. Another a statement they make on the State Department document, we do not fear globalization. They want sustainable development. Another buzzword, a more integrated approach, etc., etc. Pages of it. Does it sound as if it's just about trade? No, of course it isn't. Now, we had a quote here which is very interesting. This was reported in the Financial Times of London, which is a bit like your Wall Street Journal. It's a newspaper not given to flights of fancy. Vicente Fox, when he was president of Mexico, came over to Europe, and he was talking about the USA opening its borders, ho-ho, as if he needs to, linking an economic union <laughs> with Canada and Mexico, etc. And this is the key quote. In the same way as the EU has been turned into a social and political union. Ultimately, they plan a 34-nation free trade area with 800 million people. This is what they agreed to aim for at the Summit of the Americas. We were also told time and time and time again the EU was just about trade, our country's sovereignty was not at risk, it would never involve politics, it wouldn't affect us at all. It would be good for you, peace, prosperity, lots of jobs. This is how they sell it, very simplistically, but it works. And then eventually you find out that they were lying all along and knew it all along, and I've got quote after quote uh, to prove that as well. There is a petition against this, and uh, why, is it, why are people actually waking up? Because the North American unit is fast being set up with very few people noticing. This is what happened in September 2006. There was a meeting in Banff, Canada, at a hotel called the Castle in the Rockies. And they outlined policies with titles like A Vision for North America, Demographic and Social Dimensions of North American Integration. Top people were there, and I've got the full documentation with me here because it was supposed to be a secret meeting, but an eavesdropper got in, stole all the documents or purloined them, or maybe it was one of the delegates, I never did find out, but it came down to me from the Action Party of Canada, and we've published the full details on our website, and uh, if you actually um, have time, you can call by me, I've got the full documentation here, 
I know who was there, what they discussed, who chaired every meeting, what rooms they were in, who the delegates were, what companies they represented, etc., etc. It is not a figment of anyone's imagination. And I have the facts to prove it. This is happening at a rate of knots, and they're doing it where they think people won't notice, and they can rely on the press not to report it. The plot is thickening. This last week, they were meeting to talk about all this, and an organization called grassfire.org is trying to get 100,000 signatures on a petition to go to your president within 30 days of this summit. Now, don't come to me and sign anything. Go to their website. The message they're trying to get across is stop giving our country away, and the petition calls for Congress to step in because Congress has never approved any of this. This is grass fire trying to fight the North American Union. If enough people get stirred up, this can be at least delayed. I think prophecy indicates that there will be a one world government. I think we'll have ten regions, and I think the North American region will be one of them. The EU will probably be the, the dominant region from what I've seen. But you can probably delay this at least until the financial crash comes. This is one of the organizations, <laughs> and that's another story, and I, and I know that Chuck Mister is going to talk about the financial dimensions of some of this tonight, because uh, it's interesting when we have these conferences, nobody knows what anyone else is really going to talk about, but it's absolutely amazing. The Lord works in mysterious ways, and uh, you know, whereas Satan tries to stop my computer working, the Lord very wonderfully dovetails the speaker's agendas so that we talk about something and someone else follows it on. I saw it last week in Oklahoma City. It was absolutely amazing. Everybody just seemed to sort of have a little bit of the jigsaw. Anyway, I'm just telling you that people are waking up and fighting this already. It can be delayed. You can make life a little hot for them anyway. One week ago, there was a march in Seattle. March for America, take America back. And they said, again, we're going to fight this North American Union, which everybody says doesn't exist. Um, and this is what they said. Let's help lay out the unwelcome mat. This was uh, March 2005 when the Security and Prosperity Partnership was signed in Waco, Texas. They look awful pleased with themselves. They probably just had a good lunch. And um, they signed this deal, and um, it's been full speed ahead ever since. This is their logo. Excuse me, you can see the three flags here um, and here. And uh, they're very fast forwarding on the integration of the three countries. So, well, it could, you know. A spy in the U.S. Treasury sent me this. I'm not supposed to lie. These are the buzzwords you look for. Closer integration, connectivity, hemispheric cooperation. We've heard it all before. They're joining you up in the new world order. I like the, the cameras here. This is something I got off the web. Those with no chip merge right. And there's uh, the eye and the triangle watching everybody. It's the eye, uh, the triangle is called uh, on the back of the dollar bill. Here it is. It's an occult symbol which uh, some of you may have seen. Not everybody reads their money. Uh, most of us like to spend it if we have any. In fact, you'd probably be hard put for reading material if you sat and read your currency. But on the bottom it says, down here, Novus Ordo Seclorum. It's the new order of the ages around the bottom here. In other words, the new world order. It's been a long time in gestation, a long time in the coming. This is quite a fun thing, really. An RAF squadron leader who should have more things to do with his time, but he sent me this Charles comic that he bought because he said he saw it. And I thought of you, Alan. He said, this was 1966. And he said they were predicting a world government. Probably it was part of a move to indoctrinate children, or maybe it was just innocent. But when I saw this picture, I thought, it looks just like the EU parliament that I was in. And there it is, very, very similar. It's a puppet parliament because no one speaks anyone else's language. There's umpteen different languages, and they spend about a billion a year on translation, so that uh, it's a very sort of motley collection of people who can't understand each other. So how can you have a debate when, for example, um, say a German makes a joke? It's un <laughs> unlikely, but it might happen. Uh, <laughs> And then a little while later, maybe an Italian sitting next to him gets the translation, and he laughs, you see. 
But by then, someone else is talking about cremations or something. <laughs> so it's a very strange place. And, uh, and you know, you can only talk for maximum 90 minutes. Sorry, not 90 minutes, that's me. 90 seconds. <laughs> no, how can you ever develop a theme or talk about anything? I mean, no one could actually develop a theme in 90 seconds. So I'd be out of business, that's for sure. You got to midnight. <laughs> but uh, I've got a lot of material. But um, no, it, it's a puppet parliament. It's there to give the semblance of democracy. It's not a real democracy. The men who sit there, the women who sit there, they have no real power. They sit, by the way, not in national groups, but according to their politics. So on the far left, you have the Reds. Then the socialists are pink. On the far right, you have the fascists. Then you have the conservatives, lighter blue. In the middle, you have the greens and the yellows and whatevers. And when it all comes together, it makes a rainbow. And in fact, that's how they illustrate it when they show you the film in the EU par Parliament telling you how it works. When I went over there, Constance Cumbie had just brought out her book, um, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. This was over 20 years ago that when I first went out. And I was uh, out there looking for Antichrist and um, a very strange... <laughs> I'm digressing, which Pat told me not to do. A very funny thing happened, actually, which shows you should never make assumptions. You should never say, he looks like the man. I was looking in the Parliament over several days of debate for the prominent speaker. Who is the man? I thought, he's probably going to be from the EU. He's probably in the Parliament. Who's the dominant personality? And there was one. There was a man. And um, I thought, he, he's the one, if there is one here. Controlled the Parliament. Anyway, after the meeting, he walked out of the building with me. And a funny thing happened. He went to the airport with me. <laughs> and then we got on the plane together, and he sat in the seat next to me. <laughs> this is all true, I can assure you. And then I thought, well, I'm going to get the first interview with Antichrist. <laughs> I was thinking of selling this story. Unfortunately, when I spoke to the man, he, I realized he was perfectly normal and certainly wasn't Antichrist. Fortunately, I never named him. I was right about one thing. He did later become head of the EU, so he was the dominant person, but he wasn't Antichrist. However, I think it's quite likely that a future head of the EU, well, the permanent president they're just trying to bring in, will be Antichrist. One of the things they've done there, first of all, is created free trade areas, start to sound familiar. Then they set up a set of common rules, sound familiar. Then you need a bureaucracy to run it all. Then finally, you abolish borders. You allow unlimited immigration. Millions and millions of people switch countries so that no one country uh, feels particularly patriotic because, for example, in Great Britain today, a quarter of the live births have at least one parent born overseas. One quarter. It's incredible. And um, this is uh, growing very rapidly. So that... Uh, Although many of these people are fine people, I mean, my own dear wife is an immigrant to Britain. A lot of immigrants are, are a great asset. However, a lot of them owe their allegiance to Allah. We've got over two million Muslims, so they don't owe their allegiance to the British crown. And if there was a crisis, their allegiance would not necessarily be to their host country, you see. So they've diluted nationhood. I think it's quite clever the way it's all being done. This is what a man you may remember, Congressman Larry McDonald, who was killed in that mysterious crash of the Koreans' airliner. This is what he said uh, many years ago. He said, the drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one-world government combining super-capitalism and communism under the same tent, all under their control. Do I mean conspiracy? Yes, I do. I'm convinced there's such a plot, international, in scope, generations old in planning and incredibly evil in intent. And uh, I think it's coming to fulfillment very, very rapidly. Now you, you look at, uh, again, time and again, what the Rockefellers say and what they do. The New World Order, you find, is about politics and religion. Back in 59, this is what their Special Studies Project panel said. We cannot escape, and indeed should welcome, the task of helping to shape a new world order in all its dimensions, spiritual, economic, political, and social. And they tried to uh, launch this via the UN. In fact, it started in Burlington, Vermont, with a new Ark of the Covenant. Now, this sounds like an incredible fantasy, but it was important because the keynote speaker was a Rockefeller. Big money was behind it. And um, they said that they were going to replace the Ten Commandments with a new Earth Charter. They marched it across, put it in the United Nations, and this is one of its uh, uh, new commandments, which Mikhail Gorbachev was kind enough to spell out. He said, 
Do not do unto the environment, there's that wonderful word again, of others, what you do not want done to your own environment. My hope is that this charter will be a kind of Ten Commandments, a Sermon on the Mount that provides a guide for human behavior toward the environment in the next century. The environment is going to be used to beat you with. It's going to be used to actually bring in all kinds of very restrictive laws, already has done. And if I had time, I could tell you a lot about it. Gorby also said... Further progress is now possible only through a a quest for universal consensus. Again, the phrase, the new world order. He's one of those trying to build it. Our new Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, one of the first speeches he made said, we're going to create a new world order to tackle non-existent climate change, which you've heard about earlier, I understand. But they'll use anything, you see. It doesn't have to be true as long as you can be made to believe it's true. Propaganda is incredible. You're not allowed to print anything... Opposing the the new green movement, by the way, very difficult to get it in the press. This is what the senior President Bush said back in 1991, at the time of the invasion of Kuwait. He said at the end, we're building a new world. He said, a world in which there is the real prospect of a new world order. This phrase is no accident. It's no uh, uh, just phrase happened by uh, happenstance. They mean it. Now, are all American presidents new world order men? It's a very interesting question. One of the things that strikes me as an observer from afar is that policies of governments, in many respects, change little regardless of who is the president. The first President Bush was a member of Skull and Bones, America's most secret society, probably the most important secret society in the world. He started the move to establish the North American Free Trade Area. Now, he's replaced by Democrat President Clinton, who carries it forward. Clinton, by the way, was a Rhodes Scholar, which is another one-world organization, which many of you probably know about. Now, the present President Bush is another skull and bones man. Uh, When he fought the last presidential election against candidate Kerry, I found out that Kerry was also in the same club. Now, the skull and bones only admits about 15 people a year, it's like having the, 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 the front two rows here of people and from those two people in the whole of America picking out two candidates, one to be Republican candidate, one to be Democratic candidate. Does that sound like a coincidence? What are the mathematical likelihood or probability of that happening by some kind of chance? I do not believe it, I'm afraid. This is one sort of the secret societies. That's been promoting a new world order for centuries, going back to the Illuminati, which I used to get onto the website of until it got blocked. But um, it was quite interesting. And for those who don't believe the Skull and Bones exists, this is their headquarters on Yale University campus. Very uh, sinister, mysterious-looking building, rather like a Masonic lodge. Uh, and you can't get in. You and I could go up and hammer on the door. Unless we're a member of the uh, ruling East Coast elite, we're hardly likely to be admitted or invited. You go in by invitation. You just don't go in saying, I'd like to join. They say, no, thank you. Now, this was the first President Bush who was a third-generation bonesman. Prescott Bush was, was another. And this is their symbol, the emblem of the Skull and Bones Club. The skull is reputedly that of Geronimo, and it's said that Prescott Bush was one of a raiding party that raided the cemetery and dug it up. 322 is interesting. Everything has a meaning. 322, the two is the second lodge. The first is in Germany. It's a German secret society. Uh, 32 refers to 1832 when it was set up. There are other explanations, but I believe that's the likely one. How did he become a bonesman? Well, the president has not denied that he is one. But one of the first things he did when he became president down in Texas, he invited a whole load of his fellow bonesmen to have a celebration of his success. And it was pictured in the press in Britain. Whether or not it was over here, I don't know. But what you do when you go into the Skull and Bones, by invitation, I won't tell you all of it, it's a bit unpleasant, but you take your clothes off and you actually go into um, a coffin, and um, then they carry you and the next day into the central part of the building and they chant over you. And to cut a long story short, you are born again as a bonesman. You become a born again bonesman. And then a bo- you're given robes with symbols on, occult symbols, and a bone with your name on it is tossed into the bone heap at the start of every meeting. It sounds seriously unpleasant to me. Within this building is a, is a crypt known as the tomb where they have a sacred room with the number 322. You can also uh, check all this 
out yourself, by the way. Now, secret societies, do they really run our countries? Well, we had a very interesting film on British television about Bohemia Grove. This was a picture taken at Bohemia Grove. There's Ronald Reagan, there's President Nixon. Um, I'm not saying that these people were necessarily uh, involved with this, but they, they obviously felt it necessary to go along to the meetings of this very secret club in order to become powerful and presidential. Anyway... We saw this film on British television, which was secretly filmed during their ceremonies. My reaction to most of this weird stuff is not to believe it. There's so many odd theories around, conspiracy theories, and I know as a long-term journalist, 42 years, uh, man and boy, um, I, I know that a lot of rumors go around and often don't stack up with the facts. So we looked into this, and I said to Pat, this can't be true. I just don't believe it. Anyway, we found out a little bit more. We were actually on a tour with the Southwest Radio Church in Southern California, and uh, we were invited one day to take a trip on a day off into Muir Woods to see the giant redwoods. And Pat and I were just walking along through the wood, looking at the trees, and suddenly there was a big plaque on the path, and it said, this is where Bohemia Grove Club was founded. And it showed the first thing they did was put up a 90-foot figure of Buddha. So right from the very beginning, they were off beam, you see. I looked into it a little bit more, having been convinced that it really did exist. And they have names like Mandalay, all the different lodges in this, this building. Hillbillies, that's big business. Caveman, oil companies. Stowaway, that's the Rockefellers. Owl's Nest, that's U.S. presidents and defense contractors. All this happens in the last two weeks of July. This is their ceremony where 1,500 American politicians and businessmen gather and the very first thing they do is have this occult ceremony in which they cremate care before a 45-foot statue of an owl. It's a very weird ceremony. It's still on the net. You can actually watch a replay of it. It was filmed in secret by Alex Jones, actually. This is what they say. O oh, thou great symbol of all mortal wisdom, owl of Bohemia, we do beseech thee, grant us thy counsel. Sounds a bit like worship to me. So I cut that short because we must move on to the biggest transport scheme in the history of the world, another figment of my imagination. The paper in um, my wife's hometown actually said this. It had a whole front-page story saying, this is not true, it doesn't exist. However, this road is actually being planned at the moment, linking Mexico, USA, and Canada. In fact, not one road, many, many roads, costing hundreds of billion. So you, didn't, you mean you didn't know about this? You mean it hasn't been on Fox, that very wonderful bastion of truth and justice and honesty in reporting, owned by Rupert Murdoch, who incidentally uh, had a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton in his Fox studios in New York a few months back. That's a surprise, isn't it? Not to anyone who knows Rupert, it isn't. Rupert's the man behind um, the Purpose Driven Books. And he's just taken over the Wall Street Journal. Oh, no. I've just been told, what, five hours? Okay, five minutes. So... <laughs> I'm going to show you some pictures of the superhighway in the small amount of time I've got before they drag me off. Is it an urban legend? Did I make it up? Let's have a look. Yeah, I made that up. Here's Rudolph Giuliani, whose law firm presumably doesn't work for figments of the imagination. He has 400 lawyers working out of Houston, and his firm is working full blast on negotiations for the Trans-Texas Corridor. It's legal counsel for a Spanish firm called Sintra, which will actually run the roads as toll roads for the first 50 years. So as you drive down these wonderful new highways, you'll be paying money to Spain. It makes you feel kind of warm inside, being so generous, I'm sure. They're going to take 145 acres of land per mile. And his client is paying a lot of money to build the first 600 miles of the super corridor. But they're eventually planning 8,000 miles of corridor. And these, when I say corridor, is far more than just a road. It's in fact 1,200 feet wide. That's four football pitches wide. And this is the first planner for the first super corridor, the biggest transport project in the history of the world. Basically, what they're going to do is truck in Chinese and other Asian goods down into Mexico, bypassing all the American ports, bypassing American dockers' jobs. American jobs are going all out of the window. They're going to employ Spani uh, sorry, Spanish, Mexican drivers, Mexican firms. In fact, the first hundred Mexican firms have already been given permission to do a trial, bring in all their um, goods from Mexico to go onto the roads of America at the moment. That trial is just starting, I believe. So they're going to come in across the border with no check. Something called Sentry, S-E-N-T-R-I, will 
is an electronic system which will log every truck that comes in. And the first port of call, here's some more of the plans which you can see for yourself on different websites. But they, their first port of call will be in Kansas City. And this is the logo for the smart port which is being built there and which features a Mexican customs facility built at your expense, and it's actually going to be Mexican government territory. I suppose it won't matter much because it's all going to be the same country anyway. But here it is, and this is the um, smart port from their own website. This is actually happening now. You can look it up for yourselves. All this is in their book with a lot of the references. Ron Paul, who I think is one of the honest men in Congress, I, I nearly said... <laughs> and have you noticed how he's kept out of the main media... Isn't it interesting? You get on the blogs and the websites, everybody loves him. The young people really like him. When we drove through Dallas, there were youngsters on the street corners jumping up and down saying, hoot if you like Ron Paul, you see. But the main media are totally ignoring him, and uh, I think that they're trying to just keep him out because he has rumbled the New World Order. He knows what it's all about. One of the very few people in America who's sussed it out. And he said, they're not just building a highway, they're building an integrated North American Union complete with a currency, a cross-national bureaucracy, borderless travel, like the EU. A North American Union will represent a step towards abolition of national sovereignty, a giant step. There's another one. There's tons and tons of this information. You could get dizzy looking at it, actually. This is a plan for the Canamex Trade Corridor. Another couple of hundred billion, I should think. This one goes all the way up to Anchorage, Alaska, eventually. This is what these superhighways are going to look like. And uh, back in um, June, Fort Worth was the destination for a lot of people moving North America forward. If you get onto their website, you can see all the things they decided, what they talked about. Now, probably one of my final slides. Why is immigration deliberately unchecked? What I often say to people is, well, do you seriously think that a country that could put men on the moon can't build a fence and operate it and man it? and stop people crossing it. It's pretty simple. The Israelis have just done it. It stopped most of the bombings in Israel. You build a wall, you keep them out. It's simple. They haven't done so. They never will done so, do so. In fact, this week I, I saw that many of the Border Patrol people, the National Guard that have been sent down there, are being withdrawn. They're still flooding in unchecked. The same is happening in Europe. They're actually diminishing and diluting the nation state as a deliberate policy. Nothing will ever be done about it. No wall will be built. Nothing. <laughs> I move on. This is one, in case, again, I show these pictures as proof, really. This is one of their meetings where, they're taking, which, where they discuss integrating what they call the Americas, hemispheric integration. They use words that ordinary people don't really understand, but it sounds highfalutin. What they mean is linking, joining, one world, one country. So, which is it to be, the USA or the North American Union? Well, a lot of people are fighting. Even the Teamsters Union has woken up because they realize the borderless trade means the work goes to the cheapest labor, and it won't be American labor. This was the front of the Teamsters magazine. So NAFTA kills. Well, it kills jobs. American jobs are going south. Financial doom is ahead. Now, I know that Chuck Mister is going to actually elaborate on, elaborate on this, but to cut a long story short, there have been a lot of tremors in the markets. The situation, I believe, is far more serious than has been generally reported. When you see central bankers going on TV trying to be boring, like the Bank of England governor did the other day, almost asleep, saying, there is no crisis. You know there's real big trouble. <laughs> and um, the head of the German uh, finance uh, ministry said that the banking crisis was the worst since 1931. And the biggest bank in Germany had to be bailed out with billions of dollars of government money only in about the last week. French banks have been saying they've got bad loans, billions. One British, British bank... Again, coming back to America, but rippling around the world from the subprime mortgage crisis. So what could happen? The dollar could collapse. A world economic crisis could follow. If America goes bankrupt, any hope of uh, retaining your sovereignty will probably be gone because you will be at the mercy of your creditors, most of whom are your enemies, like communist China. Foreclosures are up. Delinquent loans are up. Almost a quarter of American banks reported a loss in the last quarter. Things are very shaky out there. That I'm sure you'll empathize with. A lot of Americans can't afford the American way of life. 
nor, nor can we in Britain. So we're heading, I believe, this may not be the final crunch, but it could be a, a dry run for the final crunch. We're heading for a financial storm. So they'll have to bring this in before the new world order because if things are going swimmingly, if everyone's got jobs, if everyone's got money in the bank, if everyone can pay their mortgage, they're not going to turn to a strong man. However, if people panic, if people can't pay their mortgages, if people are in trouble, their jobs are gone, what can we do? Well, here comes the strong man who says, I'll solve your problems. Dictators ride in on the back of economic chaos. The last time this happened, we got Adolf Hitler. And I think I'll uh, end there because uh, it's a point which we could uh, think about this evening. And I believe that uh, that time could be very close, which means the rapture could be very close, which means that our time is short to snatch some lost souls off the rocks. The purpose of this is not to amuse or entertain. It's to get your attention. The important thing is that we are to be witnesses for the Lord out there in a lost and dying world, a world that uh, doesn't know Christ, doesn't know it's lost, but very soon will have no way to turn because we who are to tell them will be removed. Time is very short and a lot of people are working to bring in the collapse of our society. We must become aware Christians. We must arm ourselves with the truth. Our Lord is the truth. I love the truth. We must learn to use the truth, not to be aggressive, but to put pressure on our leaders, on our congressmen, on our president, on all those we can influence. We should get on to radio talk shows, write to newspapers, and get the facts first. And then perhaps we can convince people that uh, this is happening very, very quickly. And it's time to do something about it. It's time to wake up, Christians. I'll end there. This has been Christians Better Wake Up, presented by Alan Franklin. To receive a free catalog of over 200 awesome Stealing the Mind Bible studies on DVD, CD, or audio tape, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 24 hours a day, or on the web at compass.org.